You could have went home after shopping for dinner. Once there, she went to her room and changed out of her uniform. It seemed her brother hadn't gotten home just yet. Knowing him, he was probably busy, considering he appeared to have gotten engaged with another major case. Yukari passed the passed the living room after sunset and entered the kitchen. She slid on an apron and produced two cups worth of rice from the rice bin. As soon as she was ready, she rinsed the rice and began kneading it. The water was positively glacial in December. However, Yukari simply bore with it as she conscientiously carried out her work. She poured out the murky white rice water and literally rinsed and repeated over and over. Finally, she stopped once the water was all but crystal clear, dumped the rice into the rice cooker, and filled it with water. Now all she had to do was wait. The rice cooker was top of the line. Reiji had bought it for her. A rare act of magnam- Magnanim- Oh, fucking Christ. Magnan- Magnan- Ugh, fuck it. That word. I know what magnanimous means, and I can say that with no problem. <laughs> So like, I know what she's saying, but for some reason I just can't be f fucking asked to pronounce this word right now. Then again, he'd been a bit tipsy at the time, so perhaps it had simply been an impulse purchase. You could have used to burn the rice a lot when she first started using it, but she'd long since mastered the machine. True, the flavor was a little weaker than how she used to cook it, but even she couldn't argue with its convenience. The whole thing was perfect, minus the fact that it couldn't keep the rice warm for very long. It was with that in mind, you could retrieve some vegetables from her grocery bag first, deciding to turn on the rice cooker later. She filled a wash bowl with water and rinsed the potatoes. Next, she repeated the process for the carrots. Then she peeled both and cut them into bite-sized chunks. After that, she sliced the carrots into the shape of a fan. Dicing the onions was the next item on her agenda. Once those were done, she carved lumps of beef into appropriate portions. Shortly thereafter, a pot of water started steaming, so she promptly dumped in cognac noodles and began boiling them. It was at that very moment that the living room door opened. Tadaima. Yukari looked over her shoulder and caught a glimpse of her brother. Luigi nodded and went to his room. He was probably exhausted from work. Still, it was rare for him to come home so shortly after sunset. Normally, he'd either arrive late at night or just wouldn't come home at all. And yet, Yukari always made dinner for two all the same. After all, it actually took her more time and effort to cook for one. She knew the precise portions for making a meal for two like the back of her hand, since she'd been doing it for so long. A little extra for Reiji and a little less for herself. They balanced out perfectly. When she was younger, Reiji handled the cooking after their parents died in that plane crash. However, not even a saint could have called his meals good. Hence why Yukari took the initiative in learning how to cook and usurp the kitchen. And eventually just became part of her daily routine. She'd be lying if she said there weren't occasions when she wanted to try Reiji's cooking. But considering how busy he was at the moment, it didn't appear that it would happen anytime soon. Besides, she didn't think he'd cook even if asked anyway. Not after all that happened to him, that is. He'd suffered the loss of their parents, his fiance Yukiko, and then... An old classmate flashed through Yukari's mind. Reiji had closed himself off again after her disappearance. On the surface, he tried to act like it meant nothing to him. However, his heart had frozen over ever since. That was likely why he threw his body and soul into work these days. The AG had been ravenously taking one gruesome case after the next since leaving the police. He'd probably been hoping to hunt down Yukiko's murderer in that process. And now history was repeating itself once more, with finding Toko Kachiki being his new fixation. He could have turned on the rice cooker and started frying the onions. The lingering water in the pot splattered up with the oil. She threw in the konjac noodles, potatoes, and beef once the onions were translucent. This is it. This is the best I can do to help. She couldn't find Toko. That was Reiji's job. He was the detective here. But me? All I'm good for is cooking and praying for him to come home safe. And that's it. Nothing more. And nothing less. Morning classes had ended for the day. It was only during breaks that the otherwise quiet classroom filled with even the slightest hints of chatter. And this jo just so happened to be lunch break, the longest one of the day. Yukio stayed seated at her desk as she lethargically took a lunch box out of her bag. Her mother had made the meal for her. It was a meager lunch consisting of rice and some vegetables. Yukiko had never been much of a glutton, so it was all a picky eater like her needed. 
You could have suddenly hailed Yukiko before she could dig in. You could have pushed their desks together, paying no heed to Yukiko's bewilderment. No! Fuck off. Even Kohane brought her chair over. Yukari looked apologetic when she caught sight of Yukiko's flustered expression. Of course she wanted to eat with them. The mere thought of it thrilled her. She was just having trouble keeping up with the sudden turn of events, that was all. Yukari smiled and opened her lunchbox. It was huge. The majority of it was taken up by side dishes, leaving only a small helping of rice. Kane wasted no time in snatching a piece of meat from Yukari's lunchbox. Yukio was suddenly left feeling rather uncomfortable. She rarely, if ever, ate meat. She wasn't much of a fan of potatoes either, and carrots were simply out of the question. Jesus Christ. While she'd have been fine with the contact noodles, she knew it would raise some eyebrows if that's all she had. As such, she looked to see what else Yukari's lunch had to offer. Potato salad wrapped in veggies. Sausages shaped perfectly like octopi. Yukio was aware it'd be a major faux pas to turn Yukari down. Thus, she desperately searched for anything that fit her unique palate. And spotted something. It was a black substance drenched in soy, probably seaweed or kelp. That would work just fine. However, right when Yukio was about to reach for it... Yukari-chi! Kohane pointed to the dish in question. You could have grabbed it with her chopsticks if she said they were merely grapes. You think she said that before I ate it? <laughs> School is out for the day. Yukiko sat before a sheet of sat frozen before a sheet of drawing paper in the art club's room. It was still blank. She had no idea what to draw. Plaster figures, animal bones, and wax fruit were strewn about the club room for reference. There was also some sort of large olive brown bag sitting in the corner of the room. She could have just drawn any of those, but at the same time, none of them really spoke to her. Yukiko picked up a wax lemon and studied it. If she hadn't known any better, she would have sworn she was looking at a bona fide lemon. It was a perfect recreation, down to the tiny stem and spots on the surface. Yukio turned around, fake lemon still in hand. Yukari had apparently seen right through her. Yukari placed a wax apple in a small box of similar size on Yukiko's desk. Yukio shifted positions just like Yukari suggested. Light shone on part of the apple, casting a shadow on the opposite side. Furthermore, the box's surfaces were divided equally between light and shadow from that angle. Yukio picked up her pencil and poured over the apple and box. She first drew a large circle. That doesn't look right. She scrapped the outline with her eraser and tried again. Fortunately, she felt she did a much better job on her second try. Next came the box. That one was fairly simple, considering it was all straight lines. A bit crooked, though. The door suddenly opened behind her. Ah, fuck off! Bonnie swooped down on Yukiko, spotting her from a distance like a hunter seeking her next meal. What are you no way. You suck. Yukio flipped over her paper, a flush of embarrassment dusting her cheeks. She drew nothing more than a square in a circle, yet she couldn't help herself. Kohane had spotted the wax sculpture on Yukiko's desk. Yukiko answered honestly. Kohane trotted over to Yukiri. A slight twinge of relief struck Yukiko. She flipped her drawing again and studied it briefly before turning back to the apple in the box. Just then the apple fell over. <gasps> Concerned, she compared what she'd drawn to the apple itself. It doesn't look too different, probably. Regardless, Yukiko rose from her chair and reset the apple's position. 
It was at that precise moment that the door opened once more. Konnichiwa. Saying there was a student Yukiko didn't recognize. She appeared to be an underclassman, judging by her uniform. Ara, Satosan. Yukiko approached the girl in question. It seemed they knew each other. Kore kara bukatsu? Eh, itsu mo sumimasen. Yukiko looked up to get a better look at the girl's face when suddenly the two of them locked eyes. Yukiko's gaze immediately darted toward the ground. She wasn't very good at meeting new people. More specifically, she never knew what to do in those situations. Then again, that bewilderment extended far past the first meeting. Oh, hi. san Yukio timidly looked up when Yukiri called her name. Yukio bowed, following Ayumu's lead. Yep, she said the word friend. You could have gestured to Yukiko. Oh, Yukiko oh. simply agreed without thinking, fearing Ayumu was just saying that to be polite. Ayumu made a beeline for a corner of the room and picked up the olive brown bag Yukiko had seen earlier. Upon closer inspection, Yukiko noticed a small name tag labeled Sato hanging off of it. It seemed the bag question was hers. Stink. What's in that thing? Go away. Go away. Fuck off. Go away. Kane suddenly whispered in Yukio's ear with no prior warning. Kane answered before Yukio could even properly reply. That bag did appear rather heavy now that she thought about it. Ayumu left the club room with her gear in hand. Yukio never knew they had a club like that. She assumed Oba only had ladylike associations such as flower arranging or tea ceremony. You could have smiled awkwardly. Sa <laughs> I thrust a coin before you could You could sounded downright exasperated. <laughs> I finally got one of the hundred yen coins. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> she does not give a shit. Going out of Phoenix Garden to the surface, circled with the letters 100 yen. Yukari stared blankly at me as if I told her I'd tried cooking an egg in a toaster. I scraped together all my coins and brought them to the bank to make the exchange. All because I failed to muster the courage to ask them to break my thousand yen bill. Oh, you don't understand, Yukari. I really needed this coin. It wasn't like I'd spent all day grinning like an idiot over my new coin. Just. Or so minutes. For all I knew, they could be real collector's items someday. I fished through my wallet and procured a 50 yen coin. See, Yukuri, this one says 100 on it, so it's cool. Should sound the least bit interested. Thank you. I don't care if you want to drink it, but I don't have to buy it. I want to see a new thing that's coming from the new thing. That's right. You could have graciously accepted the coin. You could have suddenly sat up straight in her chair, squaring her shoulders. I instinctively shaped up myself after seeing that. 
ていただきたいのです。10 kilos? Well, I mean, I guess. Yeah, they sell rice like the big fucking bags, actually. Yeah, that, that's not too surprising an amount, actually. Very well, thousand yen bill. We had a good run. <laughs> Bell rang, signaling the end of school. Yukiko was busy copying the words on the blackboard into her notebook. She'd been so caught up in the lecture that she hadn't been able to write it all down before class ended. And so she needed to copy the little that she'd missed before it was too late. Just then, the student on cleanup duty headed toward the chalkboard and started erasing it in a flash. White blurs spread across the blackboard. The part Yukiko hadn't finished copying was swept away. Depression incarnate existed in Yukiko's lungs. So close to. Kayahara san. It was then that you could return to face her. You got that. But there's no Tsushima's car. You could, he was holding out her notebook. Arigato. Kotsaimasu. Yukio timidly took the notebook and flipped it open. The pages were swamped with Yukuri's neat handwriting. She'd written the whole thing down word for word, almost as if she were a court clerk. The notes were easy to read and very comprehensible. Yukiko probably started copying them. <laughs> no! You fuck off! Eat shit. Finally, suddenly darted over to the pair. Yukiko listened in on them as she transcribed the parts she'd failed to catch in time. God damn, you suck. Man, I don't, listen, I don't want Yukuri to lose another friend, but like, hey, Mr. Serial Killer, like, if there's one you gotta take, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, really wouldn't be torn up over that one on the left there. Just, just throwing it out there. You know, I'd feel, honestly, I'd feel worse for Yukuri than I would for the actual victim in that situation, you know? But, hey, listen, if, it, if it's gotta happen, who am I to say no, right? Like, hey, Mr. Serial Killer Man. Just throwing some suggestions out there. We're just workshopping some ideas here. I'm saying, I'm just saying. Coffee or no gonna Moonworld? That was the name on the coffee bean bag Yukiko's mother brought home from time to time. Are they talking about the same cafe? Tokisaka-san, uh, what's swiveled toward Yukiko. Yukiko returned the notebook when she'd finished copying the part she'd missed earlier. Three of them entered the club room and embarked on their own independent endeavors. Well, that said, Kohane was simply reading a novel while Yukari was poring over an art book. Yukiko, on the other hand, was seated a short distance away, setting the box and apple from the day before on her desk once more. Once they were in position, she studied her drawing from yesterday. Not bad. Good start. The second look made it obvious that the lines were crooked. It's just, it's practice, She's just sketching, don't worry about it. It looked nothing like the sketches from her art textbook. In hindsight, simply drawing lines without a plan in mind probably hadn't been a good move. Yukio practiced a little on the edge of the paper. She ran her pencil back and forth as if she were connecting lines little by little. Eventually, they finally started to look like a bona fide sketch. Though they were still crooked, that said. Kayahara-san? Yukari called out to her. Hi. Yes. Yukio didn't know how to reply. Tokisaka-san. Her question came out completely jumbled if she'd spilled a verbal alphabet soup all over the floor. And yet Yukari smiled and nodded all the same. She sat in a chair and picked up a pencil. First move was to draw an approximation of the objects in question. That was to say, a square and a circle. However, the drawing grew more and more detailed with each stroke of her pencil. She drew the edges of the box that were framed by the light thin, by the light thin, while all lines connected to the desk were thick. Occasionally, she'd stop to compare her drawing to the real thing. Yukio watched the whole thing from behind. The nape of her classmate's cream-colored neck caught her eye. 
She could even make out the shape of her spine. Well, because you could have had short hair. Same went for her tiny little ears. You could have turned around. Ikyo knew there was no way she could tell Yukuri that she got lost in the other girl's body. Ah. Fair enough. The whole thing was strange, so Yukiko was pretty sure she didn't swing that way. The one who did is... Yukari-chi, oh. Oh. Interesting. Kalani's voice derailed Yukiko's train of thought. Yeah, okay. So, I'm guessing what they're implying is that Yukiko's friend who had died did, in fact, swing that way. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh, wait. So, uh, just a theory, right? A game theory. Um. So did... Su su uh, what the fuck was the word I was thinking of? Did the friend in question then confess to Yukiko? And Yukiko didn't know how to respond. And I'm guessing ended up in a rejection. And then... The friend in question maybe had tried to uh, off themselves in a fit of rejection, mayhaps. And that's why so many people try to pin the murder onto Yukiko indirectly because like, oh, if you would have just accepted her feelings, mayhaps. But that's the thing, when, when well, at least when we were seeing the recollection from Yukiko's point of view, they just said that, like, oh, because she was seen with her that day. Well, see, that could be connected to it. But that could be a reason why you go feel so guilty about it. Mayhaps. Mayhaps. Interesting. Interesting. She looks up to find the smallest of the group peeking at Yukari's sketchbook. The sketch Kahane had been talking about was the drawing of the Virgin Mary that had enticed Yukiko to join the club to begin with. Yeah, you gotta add your own flair to it. That's why I saw the visual show. Yeah, that's right. Same thing. Whoa, hey. Shut up. That's right. I thought why would she get in trouble for that? It's not like she's a Christian herself. Well, probably not anyway. Okay, she's not a Christian herself, but you could go, this is a Christian school. If the officials were to catch her making NSFW art of the Virgin Mary, uh, it might cause some problems. For dishonoring, for dishonoring a symbol of worship, perhaps? Or... Yukio's thoughts were derailed once again. Yukari stared curiously at Yukiko when she heard that. Just then, Yukari beamed. Yukio, suddenly feeling quite embarrassed, frantically looked away from Yukari. Yukio said her goodbyes to Yukari and Kahane, then made her way over to Kichijoji Station. A long shadow crept from her feet. I think it was on the other end of the shopping district. Eventually, after passing several standing bars occupied by men in suits, she spotted a chic billboard that read, Moon World. The sign at the door read, Open. This must be the place. Light beamed gently out the windows and illuminated the street, almost as if they were the first rays of dawn, spelling the end to a long, long night. There didn't appear to be any customers inside at the moment, from what Yukiko could tell. The woman who probably worked there was manning the counter. That was all the better for Yukiko, since she wanted to avoid bumping into her mother at this place. It was with that thought in mind, she stepped away and checked her wallet. She had 84 yen on her. Most cafes sold coffee for about 50 yen a cup, so that was probably enough. Yukiko, not in the mood to head straight home, pushed open the door. The woman behind the counter greeted her with an amiable smile. Yukio took another look around the cafe. There was a table near the entrance. 
However, the majority of the seats were at the counter. The woman behind the counter, perhaps picking up on Yukio's dilemma, addressed her in a genial tone. After doing a little thinking, Yukio decided to take the stool furthest from the entrance. She figured she wouldn't, be, she wouldn't bother other customers or stand out over there. A quick glance at the menu situated atop the counter confirmed that it was 45 yen for a cup of tea. Yukiko found herself in a tea mood at the moment. She didn't know why, considering she'd come in based on the assumption she'd have enough for a cup of coffee. But the two cost the same anyway, so it was no big deal. She seems nice. That was Yukio's first impression of the woman. Hell yeah. Yukio pulled a book out of her bag while waiting on her tea. She found the cafe quite relaxing and serene, perhaps because there were no other customers. Plus, they probably played music here, too, judging from the record player in the corner. That was definitely worth points in Yukio's book. She opened her novel and started reading in relaxed spirits. Though the book itself was ironically anything but relaxing. A cup of tea was set before Yukiko, its revitalizing fragrance soon washing over her. Yukiko stuck her finger between the pages of her book and closed it. She brought the cup to her nose, enchanted by the sweet scent it emanated despite the lack of any milk. Yukiko just held it still and appreciated the aroma for a while before gingerly adding some milk to it. The sweet tang from earlier intensified. Yukiko took a sip. Though she could tell the tea had a bit of kick to it, the milk had mellowed it out quite nicely. Oishi? The woman gazed at Yukiko, a curious glint in her eyes. Hi. Yukiko answered honestly. <laughs> Truly had been quite good. Though Yukiko was no tea connoisseur, she found it delicious, bitter punch or not. Her uniform must have given her away. Is she talking about Tokisaka and Kohane? Though curious, Yukio couldn't bring herself to ask. The woman, possibly noticing how Yukio had her finger in her book, left Yukiko to her tea. Yukio unconsciously observed her. The woman was polishing off mugs and dishes at the other end of the counter near the entrance. Yukio found the sound of water splashing music to her ears. She took another sip of tea and opened her book. I can get used to this. She'd definitely be back, that was for sure. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. We love to see more regulars at Moon World. I bought rice from the grocers near Kichijoji Station and instantly regretted it. The bag weighed 10 whole kilos. Well, yes, that is what you were told to buy. <laughs> I'm surprised you would expect it any other weight. Hauling this thing home on foot would prove to be rather rough, but that was for sure. Oh, okay. He's bad that he walked there rather than driving. Well, less rough and more a pain in the ass. Buying the stuff on impulse just because it was on sale had been an ill-advised move to say the least. Should've picked a closer store. Oh well, I used to cry over spilled milk. What was done was done. With those thoughts in mind, I decided to take a taxi. Much to my dismay, there was one hell of a line for them at the station. I'd forgotten this was rush hour for people with 9 to 5 jobs. Guess I'll just find somewhere to kill time while the line thins out. Fortunately, there was one place nearby that fit the bill perfectly. I lumbered my way over to Moon World, weighed down by the rice. For a moment, the idea of just leaving at the cafe and coming back for it at my car tomorrow crossed my mind. However, I wasn't particularly keen on wasting gas for such a short trip. The door opened. A girl in a coat and a familiar uniform sauntered out. She glanced at me for an instant, bowed courteously, and passed by. An Oba Girls Academy student, eh? Wonder if you could, he knows her. <laughs> Kyoko grinned ear to ear, only to raise an eyebrow. <laughs> I set the bag of rice on the floor, took off my coat, and plopped down onto a stool. Tokisoko <laughs> <laughs> I love that comeback. Sorry, but the band in me is on sabbatical tonight. Coffee, <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly spotted something sitting on one of the stools when I turned from Kyoko to the cafe proper. What's that? 
I rose to my feet and checked it out. It was a thin paperback book. I casually picked it up, and tensed when I saw the title. The author, Shin Katsuragi. I grabbed my coat and headed for the door. I left without waiting for Kyoko's response. The girl was heading toward the station when we crossed paths. Let's start there. The station square was populated by a sea of men and women in monochrome outfits passing to and fro. Unfortunately, the girl wasn't among them. Damn. Here I thought it'd be easy to spot a student her age at this hour. I got as close to the station as possible and looked toward the platform. There were far too many people present to allow anyone fitting her description to stand out. Guess I'll check Inokashi out of park then. I still can't find her after all that, I'll just call it quits. I swiftly checked Inokashira Park's promenade. Though dark, the path was sparsely lit by streetlights, fortunately. My breaths came out as white puffs of steam. Much to my vexation, I hadn't bumped into anyone since I'd arrived. She must have already gotten on a train by now. But just as I was about to give up and head back to Moon World, I spotted the girl in question leaning against the pond's fence. Of course, you have to be in that sp <laughs> Okay. It was enough that you look like her, you have to start striking her poses too, huh? Her eyes danced around the sky as though lost in thought. Yeah. The girl inched back when I gave her a little wave. Yeah, guess she has every right to be cautious. The girl fished through her bag. I handed the book over. <laughs> You're the rice delivery man. <laughs> Her eyes gleamed with recognition when she looked up and saw me. <laughs> the girl bowed to me. <laughs> the puzzled look swept over the girl's visage. I chose my words carefully. Much as I wished otherwise, I was painfully aware of the events the book was based on. Still, it would have been wrong to let an innocent girl in on all that. The girl delivered her verdict after mulling over the matter for a bit. The novel was a semi-autobiography semi of Shin Katsuragi. No, Shinji Mamiya. I'd been lying if I said I found him completely unsympathetic, but at the end of the day, it still didn't excuse what he'd done. Those words had me extremely concerned, to say the least. Yeah, that's fair. Her voice lacked even the slightest trace of emotion. The girl shook her head, her expression tinged with unease. The girl gave me one last bow before spinning on her heels and racing off toward the station. It almost looked like she was running away. Couldn't exactly blame her. That was a pretty personal subject to be getting into with a total stranger. Still, I didn't want her to think I was chasing her, so I killed some time over by the pond. He saw the mother who'd love him, huh? No, the thing Shinji Mami had truly wanted wasn't love. It was a conceited and purely one-sided delusion. Thus, I worried for the girl. In hindsight, I wished I'd asked for her name, but it was far too late for that now. Maybe we'll meet again someday, though. I step back into Moon World. I returned to my original seat. Kyoko promptly served me some coffee. I sipped on the steaming cup of Joe. My hands froze when I heard Kyoko mutter those words. Though I immediately knew who she was referring to, I shook my head in vehement denial of her claim. That's right. She also often worried about her relationship with her foster mother. I mean, Reiji, if you want to deny it, go ahead, but, uh, listen. 
The coffee tastes awfully bitter after that exchange. Yukiko flopped under her bed as soon as she got home. She never met that man before. He had spilled her heart out to him all the same. Perhaps she'd gotten carried away once since he'd asked what she thought of the book. Yukiko felt that she'd run her mouth about things even she herself didn't understand very well. Grace practically melted from the embarrassment of the memory. She shoved her face into her pillow. Much to her chagrin, the heat simply refused to go away. I don't need another teen catching feelings for Reiji. We're not doing this again. English class was in session. Yukari stared vacantly at her textbook. Her teacher was reading off English sentences. The words themselves weren't all that difficult to understand. There was a conversation about Mark and Seth arguing over who went first. Why not just decide over rock, paper, scissors? I would cut out any arguments. Yukari's eyes shifted from her book to the window. It was a cool yet sunny day. Thanks to that, she could see far off into the distance. A donut-shaped cloud bobbed across the horizon. Hmm, what should I make for dinner tonight? Now that I think about it, Reiji did bring rice home last night. Pickled radishes would pair well with that. I should also grab some croquettes on my way home. Not to mention miso soup. Though a simple dinner, it had sufficed. You could have rose to her feet and looked at the blackboard. The sentence was fairly easy. You could have did as she was told. Yukio let out an odd whisper from the seat behind. You could have kept her voice low so the teacher wouldn't notice. Yukiko hastily got to her feet when she was called on. You could have quietly fed her the translation. Yukiko whispered gratitude into Yukari's ear just before sitting down. Maybe I should have said German Emperor, to be clear. The thought bubbled in Yukari's mind. Oh. That music took a sharp shift in tone. Going from just like the cheerful school music, and then all of a sudden, dum. <laughs> Doji took the short walk from Kunitachi Station at the Blessed Congregation's headquarters to in Kokobunji once again. No reporters surrounded the premises, unlike the other day. Instead, a tranquil rural winter landscape awaited her. However, that did nothing to diminish the eccentric aura engendered by the building itself. A black car was parked near the entrance. That meant at least one of the leaders, whether Odebe or Utsuki, was on the premises. That was a promising sign, as Toji's whole trip would have been pointless otherwise. She'd gone through the proper channels to arrange an interview, without the help of the police. Naturally, the meeting came with a plethora of restrictions, but simply getting the chance to ask questions was all that mattered to her. She needed to suss out what sort of people the organization's leaders were, regardless of how fruitless the discussion itself proved to be. Toji checked her watch. It was a little before 2 p.m. Right on schedule. Once she made sure of that, she knocked on the front door. A gloomy voice answered from within. Door opened. Toji furtively surveyed the interior as the dour woman beckoned her inside. There appeared to be quite a number of people present. They were gathered in a vast room, performing various tasks. Must work this place. Must be work this place does on the side. Sure as hell beats paying for some praying for some weird shit, I guess. Toji stepped inside. The woman bowed her head before departing. Toji scanned the room up and down while waiting. It certainly didn't feel like a drawing room or an office. She had to guess it was probably a hall for aesthetic training. Alright, Google, what the fuck does aesthetic mean? Characterized by or, or suggesting the practice of severe self-discipline and abstention from all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Okay. 
so it's a very empty and drab room to for aesthetic training to so to train people to not want to indulge okay sure all right if you say so it all just stood in the opposite end of the room shrine to some deity maybe what's inside there was some writing on the occupying talisman but it was too stylized for toji to read all she can make out was the word blessed Apart from that, the altar was also adorned with candles, bells, and dumplings offered as tributes. Nothing that appeared to tie back to the murder. And again, Toji had known from the outset she wasn't just going to find a fetus clay doll sitting out around in the open. Now they could always be hiding one. Man's voice boomed behind her. Toji turned that way to find a middle-aged man with a beard. It was Keigo Utsuki. Utsuki bowed. Much as Toji would have loved to ask about Mizuki Itose, she was certain she'd get no answers on the subject in this place. <laughs> Work. Utsuki answered flatly, as though she'd merely been asked for the time. That much was already public knowledge by this point. Toji nodded and threw all the information down on her notebook. おかげさまで何度か食い縁は重ねています。こちら日本部を置いた理由は手頃な物件がちょうどあったからですよ。もちろん。戦利教のイメージを払拭する意味もありましたが。戦利教から天気会に至る経緯は。それは。The voice resounded from right behind Taji. When did he get here? 我々はもともと戦利教という名前ではなく。The man took it out of Slowly circled around Taji. 天気の会を設立なされました教師様がお隠れになり。Rodebe stopped in his tracks, standing directly across from Toji. Hmm, maybe it's just me, but he looks a bit green around the gills. Is he sick? その時はあなたたちも戦利教として活動を。我々は元の教師様との縁が強く、戦利教の運営からは遠ざけられていたのですよ。I mean, listen, uh, what was its name? Arashima. If we remember what he said, the, the uh, original founder of the Congregation of the Blessed wasn't, like, the best person either, right? Like, he wasn't doing all the murder and crazy shit, right? But he was also, like, having his way with, like, a lot of the women in the cult, as a lot of cult leaders like to do. So who knows what else he might have been doing behind the scenes. He was no saint himself. Just to keep that in mind, right? So to be like, oh no, we, we were very close to the original leader, all right? We had nothing to do with that seminary business. It's like, okay, so you didn't do the really bad shit, but you were connected with the guy who was still doing some bad shit, right? So let's not, you know, let's not pretend here, buddy. Yeah, no wonder I didn't see them all those years ago then. Toji nodded. Toji begrudgingly nodded. Seemed they'd done their homework on her. Rodebe continued as if that little exchange hadn't happened. The longer Rodebe's speech went, the fiercer the fire behind it blazed. Yokara 
千里教ではなく典型の会の教えを受け継ぐ会だしかし信者の数が多くなったのは千里教の時で典型の会の頃はそれほどでもなかったと聞いている誤った教えを正すのも我々に課せられた使命なのだよ Meaning they made Sunday's believers convert to the blessed congregation, huh? Tenkei no Kai no Oshie to wa. Hito o skui, kibo o ataeru koto. What a load of bullshit. <laughs> Doji had looked into the original founder long ago. He'd been a perverted old man who readily indulged in sins of the flesh. Yeah, exactly. That's why he'd been despised and murdered by the faction that formed Senri. And again, perhaps he truly had held such lofty ideals when he initially established the Congregation of the Blessed, only to be corrupted by the march of time. If that were the case, then that meant it wasn't the founder who'd been crazed by religion. Arabe interrupted to Toko's train of thought. You love to spread suffering. Mere difference in perspective wasn't enough to explain this discrepancy. So he's a zealot, huh? Arabe had probably been blindly loyal to the original founder. Thus, he justified everything the man had done. If the founder had raped women, then Arabe convinced himself that it made those women happy. If the founder embezzled funds, then Arabe would believe he'd need them to save the world. He even accepted the founder's gluttony as something positively sacred. Let's give Shot Orebe a look. Toji checked her watch. It wasn't even 3 p.m. yet. Utsuki was apparently cutting the interview short. Orebe exited the room. So, what do you think? 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 What do you